He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Some eight centuries before Jesus of Nazareth stood before Pontius Pilate, the prophet Isaiah penned these words that are recorded in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. <clears throat> this passage about the righteous servant describes Messiah's redemptive suffering eight centuries before Jesus is born. For Isaiah, the suffering servant is the perfect representative of faithful Israel. And all through the centuries, listening to Isaiah's prophecy has been for the faithful a deep encouragement because it tells us that what happened on the cross that day, God had foreknown and foreplanned for centuries. It describes in captivating detail, eight centuries before the events of Calvary, the suffering of Messiah Jesus by whose wounds we are healed. The suffering servant is described as being silent, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep, a sheep before its shearers is silent. He opened not his mouth. So fast forward 800 years and we now see Jesus before Pilate on that fateful Friday we call good. In John 18 and 19 are described in brutal detail the unfair trial, the abuse of process, the human degradation and humiliation, the almost unbelievable torture, and finally the execution of Jesus of Nazareth. Through this past week, all through this past week, I've been drawn to verse 10, like a moth to a flame. By the way, when you find that happening, and it will happen to you as you read God's Word, because God's Word is living, and it addresses you as you read it. You know, we think we take the, read, the Word and we read it, but what really happens is the Word of God reads us, and it speaks to us. When a word grabs you, when a phrase or a sentence grabs you, you need to pause and linger over that word and try to understand what God's trying to teach you in that moment. Verse 10 has grabbed me. Pilate asked Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus is silent. As Pilate's question hangs in the air, Jesus opened not his mouth. Pilate is simply astonished by Jesus' silence. He's never met anyone like this. It would be a very rare thing for a foreign prisoner of the Roman Empire to be given an audience, a chance to defend himself before the procurator or governor. Foreigners would not get that privilege, but this one is. And afforded the opportunity to defend oneself before the one with the power of life and death, no one is ever silent. This is not a moment for silence, it's speak up and defend yourself time. But this man, Jesus, like a lamb led to the slaughter, opened not his mouth. Jesus' silence makes no sense to Pilate. Eventually, baffled by the enigma before him, Pilate blurts out, To me you will not speak? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? I know Good Friday is not a time for a grammar lesson, but let me just look at that verse with you for a moment. Do you see the duplicated use of the word I, authority? I have authority. It's unnecessary in Greek. It's unnecessary in English. It's unusual and unnecessary, but there it is. By reduplicating the word exousia, authority, the emphasis of the sentence is clearly upon authority. <laughs> Pilate says, to me you won't speak? The effect of all of this is for, it's as though Pilate wants to say, you fool, don't you know that I'm in charge here? 
I have authority here. You can see him puffing out his chest and stamping his foot and demanding respect. Do as I say or else. Do you not know I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? <coughs> the sentence bears a striking resemblance to Jesus' claim nine chapters earlier, I lay down my life that I might receive it back again. Jesus said, I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to receive it back. It's the only place in John's Gospel where the word authority appears twice in the same sentence. Both these two places. John 10, Jesus speaking. John 19, Pontius Pilate speaking. This is no grammatical coincidence. New Testament scholar Ramsey Michael says, the redundant repetition of I have authority in both passages links them unmistakably together as if on a collision course. <coughs> the collision is between the competing claims of authority of Pontius Pilate and of Jesus. Now on the face of it, there's only one person here who has any power or authority. Pontius Pilate has it all. Regally arrayed, seated on the judgment seat in his impressive headquarters, surrounded by well-armed Roman soldiers, Roman standards flapping in the breeze. Surrounded by these symbols, we see Pilate proclaiming, I have authority, I am in charge. Now Jesus of Nazareth is also there, and he presents a rather different picture. He has been scourged, given the 39 lashes, uh, which savage beating often weakened the prisoner to the point that death came very quickly when they were crucified. Doubtless Jesus is in severe pain and bleeding profusely. He's been beaten, ridiculed, mocked, and now he wears this cruel crown of thorns jammed onto his head. Jesus is alone. Friendless, defenseless, powerless, a dead man walking, and strangely silent. So where really does authority set to settle Jesus' fate lie? With Jesus or with the Roman governor? There is so much more going on here than we see at first glance. As we've watched the story unfold, we've seen Pilate going in and out, in and out. We read John 18 and 19. You'll see constantly this movement. The Jewish leadership are outside. They won't come into Pilate's fortress because it's the eve of Passover. They don't want to be ritually defiled. There's an irony here. It's fascinating. They won't be ritually defiled by entering a Gentile's dwelling but they're willing to perjure themselves to bring about the death of an innocent man. And later, these religious leaders are able to say, we have no king but Caesar. So they defile themselves with their lips, but they won't enter the praetorium. So Pilate goes back and forth. Seven times he moves in chapters 18 and 19. Inside his fortress talking to Jesus, outside to talk to the leaders of the Jewish religious uh, powers that be, back and forth goes Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Jesus is strangely silent. For all his insistence about his authority and power, Pilate does not really look like he's free to decide at all. He fears the crowd. He fears for his own job security. If there's a riot, he's probably finished as procurator. We see him like a pathetic ping pong ball being batted back and forth, caught between his conscience and his fears. Pilate really is pitiable. Outwardly, Pilate may control all the levers of power, but he's a puppet. Before him stands Jesus, choosing not to defend himself. Jesus, in perfect communion with his heavenly Father, loving us so much 
that he is in the process of laying down his life for the sheep. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, recall that one of his disciples, one gospel says Peter, the other one says one of the disciples, drew his sword to defend him and struck off the chief priest's ear. Peter says, put your sword back in its place. Do you not think I could call upon my father and he would send 12 legions, 10,000 angels to defend me? But Jesus does no such thing. Instead, Jesus will carry his own cross to Golgotha. And there, at the time he chooses, give up his spirit. Jesus gives up his life for you and me. Pilate doesn't take it from him. Very different sorts of authority set in contrast here. Some of you have been attending Terry Dance's, Bishop Terry Dance's Lenten Bible Study Series. It's been a, 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 a good time. I've enjoyed being at these times of, of teaching and fellowship. One of the images uh, Bishop Terry held up last week was that on Palm Sunday, or a day or two before that, there were two processions into the Holy City. Jesus' procession and the procession a day or two before or after of Pontius Pilate. You see, Pilate's usual res residence was Caesarea Maritima by the, on the Mediterranean seacoast, about a day's march up to Jerusalem. But for all the major festivals of the Jews, procurator, riding a war horse, would travel with about half a legion of Roman soldiers up to Jerusalem to keep peace during the festival. Can you imagine the intimidating entry into Jerusalem? Pilate and his entourage, the rhythmic pounding on the cobblestones of 2,600 men, the heavy infantry of the 12th Thunderbolt Legion marching in, banners flying, officers on horses, and 2,000 infantrymen in full battle kit. Rome would put on such a display to remind all and sundry who was really in charge, who has authority here. And on the other side of the city, coming down the footpath from the east, down the Mount of Olives and across the Kidron Valley and up into Jerusalem, through the eastern gate, the beautiful gate, into the temple, temple is Jesus, astride the foal of a donkey, accompanied by his Galilean friends who are singing the songs, singing Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Quite a contrast. Today, we see Jesus silent before Pilate, Pilate postures and demands respect. Jesus is preparing to die in our place and for us. To a casual observer, Pilate condemns Jesus to die and sends him to the cross. At a glance, just one more troublemaker dealt with with Roman efficiency. But to the eyes of faith, Jesus goes deliberately and intentionally to the cross, laying down his life for us. The difference here is everything. Jesus' death is no mistake. Jesus didn't stumble into Jerusalem on the wrong Friday and end up being crucified for being in the wrong place on the wrong day. Jesus went to Jerusalem with one purpose in mind, give his life in exchange for you and me. Jesus takes our sin on himself and dies with it so that you and I might be set free. Jesus chooses to go to the cross and you and I receive in exchange eternal life. This is crucial to grasp. And I use the word crucial deliberately. It comes from the Latin word crux or cross. You see, the central part of an argument is what we call crucial. The most important fact we would call the crux of the matter. And for us who follow Jesus, the central truth, the most important fact, 
the thing that if you don't get this right, you won't get anything else right in the whole Christian faith, is that what happened on that Good Friday was Jesus choosing to die for us. He didn't end up on a cross because he had a bad day or because Pontius Pilate said so. Jesus' death was not happenstance. Jesus gave his life intentionally and deliberately because he loved you and me more than he loved his own life. Let me conclude with the explanation the Apostle Paul gives of these events in his letter to the Colossians. And I'm using the version in the message, Colossians chapter 2. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants of the universe of their sham authority at the cross. And he marched them naked through the streets. What was nailed to the cross? Paul says it was the indictment, the arrest warrant for you and me. And it was canceled by nailing it to the cross. Pilate thinks he's crucifying Jesus and nailing him to a cross. God says what's nailed to the cross is the rap sheet that stands against you and me. And as for the procession that Pilate ordered, degrading Jesus, making him drag his cross through the streets, Paul says from the perspective of eternity, Jesus stripped all the spiritual tyrants of the universe of their sham authority, and he marched them naked through the streets. The march to the cross is led by Jesus. At the cross, Jesus, the one who before Pilate opened not his mouth, defeats our old enemies of sin and death. His total victory of these age-old tyrants is accomplished on the Friday we call good. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed.